Hey, what if I told you that the day you were born, you were given something that carries the power of life and death, and you actually carry it around every day, all day long? Would you wanna be conscious of that thing? Would you maybe wanna learn how to even control that thing a little bit? Stick around if you wanna know more. My name's Zach White and I pastor Revolution Church, an incredible church in the San Antonio, Texas area, all about starting a revolution of grace in one life at a time. If you wanna know more about the ministry or get involved or even support it financially, you can get all the details online at revyourlife.com. Most of all, we're just excited that you're with us today. And what I wanna to do today is I wanna to, I want to jump back into our discussion. We're gonna do this for four or five weeks. We're calling it, This Is Us. And we're talking about the us we all say we want. We're talking about our families, okay? We're talking about your marriage, your kids. We're talking about those dynamics. What does God's word say about the family dynamic? What are, what are some of the best tools and best wisdom God has given us that can help our families be healthier than ever? How can we be like, man, that, that's what I want for us? How can we actually live that dream out? And, and today, I actually wanna talk about this. I wanna talk about our tongues today. I'm calling it tongue-tied. Humor me, stick your tongue out. I know it's weird in church, just come on, do it, y'all. I'm the only one that can see you, and I'm not weirded out, okay? Put your tongue out, and just say the title with me. Ready? Tongue-tied. All right, that's what we're gonna talk about. We're gonna talk about how we're all tied together by our tongues, okay? This is so powerful for our families, so powerful for our marriages. Every single one of us have had those moments where we say something, and as the words are exiting our mouth, our brain catches up. Have you had one of those moments where you're like, ah, and you wish you could grab the word and pull it back, but you can't, right? I'll never forget, early on in ministry, um, this family in the church called me, and they said, Pastor, it's really bad. Uh, our dad, he's going to have to have this surgery. The doctor says it's about a 50-50 chance that he makes it through this. Could you please come uh, right before he's going into surgery, and could you pray for him? And I said, absolutely. So I get there, and you want to talk about such a crazy environment to be in because it's this weird thing where they're kind of trying to say their goodbyes, but you also don't want to say goodbye because you're trying to believe in faith that he's going to be totally fine. And I was like, man, I got big shoes to fill right now. And so I prayed and I thought it was a pretty good prayer. I thought I could like spike the football after that prayer. If y'all know what I'm talking about, right? So I pray. And when I say amen, I mean, it was timed so perfectly. The doctors push him through the double doors. They say, you can't go any further. And then I should have just stopped talking. But instead, I yelled through the doors, hey, man, see you on the other side. <laughs> and of course, what I meant was, bro, you're totally going to be fine. You're going to make it through this. Everything's going to be good. But what it sounded like is, you're going to die. <laughs> see you in heaven. That's what it sounded like. Now, listen, thank God that guy lived, y'all. And he's totally fine today. And when I see that family, they still make fun of me for saying that. <laughs> Have you ever thought about this? Our words, that, this is like one of those passages of scripture we've probably all heard and read, but, but we just don't do it. We just don't do it because we don't think about it much. Proverbs 18, death and life. It's all right here. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Now, look at the idea that is tied to this tongue idea, okay? Those who love it will eat its fruits. He who finds a wife, whoa, scripture, chill out. You're shifting gears on us. Maybe, maybe not. He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. And then he's talking about friendships. A man of many companions may come to ruin, but there's a friend who sticks closer than a brother. What is the Bible doing here? I think there's a reason that these ideas, relationships, and our words are linked together in Scripture. God is trying to tell us, he's trying to remind us, our tongues are what tie us together. We connect with each other through our words, right? It's the most powerful connection we have with each other is, is through our words. Anytime there's any disconnect in any relationship, if you work hard enough to trace it back, where is the genesis of that disconnect? It's always a word. Now, you might think, no, it was what they did, but I bet if you think a little harder, before they did that thing that made the disconnect in the relationship, they said that thing. They said something. It always goes back to our words. Every word is releasing life 
or death into our relationships. And, and marriage in particular is such a powerful example of this. If you want to connect deeply with your spouse, you've got to do it through your words. You absolutely have to learn to use your words. Some, some of you have a bad marriage right now because you got a bad mouth. Some of you have a bad relationship with your kids right now because you got a bad mouth with your kids. Some of you have a bad financial situation right now because you speak death into your financial life, right? Some of you lost a job because you spoke a way you shouldn't have spoke to your boss, right? It's all about the words. And I love what it says in Ephesians 5, and it's going to sound like it's about marriage, but it's actually not. Husbands, this means love your wives, just as Christ loved the church. That part's kind of about marriage, okay? But then he says, Jesus gave up his life for her, his bride, to make her holy and clean. And look at this. How do you do it? Washed by the cleansing of God's word. God changes us. God cleanses us. God challenges us always with his word. Always with his word. He washes us, his bride, you and I, the local church, with his word. Husbands, are you washing your wife with the word of God? Or are you like sandblasting her? What are you doing? Wives, I know it's hard to find something good about us dudes, okay? But there's something. Work hard, find that good thing, and, and speak to that. I mean, most good things in my life, even this church, started after my wife spoke it over me. Life and death is right there. We're either getting in agreement with God right here or we're going our own way or even the enemy's way with how we speak. It's said in Proverbs, life and death are in the power of the tongue. Now, think about how powerful the tongue is. How did God create everything? Did he like wave his hand? No, he spoke. He spoke everything into existence. He spoke the planet into existence. He spoke the weather systems into existence. He, he spoke the day and the night into existence. He spoke you and I. He, he spoke the plants, the animals, all of it. It came from his words. And we are made in God's image. And so somehow our words are also powerful, just like God's words are very, very powerful. Now, we don't have all power. We can't speak things into existence. But our words carry weight. I want us to camp on this thought for a minute, and you're going to see that James really camps on it, really, really kind of hammers us with it. The tongue is not just powerful. I want to make sure we understand this. It's disproportionately powerful. The tongue is not just powerful. It is disproportionately powerful. It's, it's heavy, and we all know this because the times we could think of from our past where we were hurt most, it's because of something somebody said. But isn't it interesting how when we're the ones speaking, we don't seem to think that they matter quite as much. Like we'll lob things out there and we think, oh, they'll be fine. Like we can just take it, oh, I didn't mean that. Oh, I was just joking, right? And this goes for everybody. High school students in the room, listen, there's a lower classman that needs your life-giving words bosses or business owners in the room. There's employees in your industry, in your organization that need your life-giving words. Dads, I believe more than anyone else on the face of this planet, your kids need to hear life-giving words out of your mouth. And our spouses and our communities and our churches and, and the list could go on and on and on about how much our words matter. Problem is, I think that we tend to think our words, I want to give you an illustration of how disproportionately powerful our words are. We tend to think our words are like this, right? And here's the thing about this. I can throw these ping pong balls. None of y'all are going to get hurt. You're just going to laugh and think I'm cute and funny right now, right? I can, Gabe, wham! I can even try to peg my brother over there, right? And it's totally fine. Why? Because it's just this little airy thing. And I think that we think our words are like this. No big deal. They'll just bounce and ricochet right off of everybody, but that's not true. Truth is, our words are more like this. Let's throw this one up, right? If I take this one, somebody's getting hurt. Thank you, sound guy. And I'm telling you, the Bible's telling us our words are a lot more like this than they are like this. There's no proportion here, is there? Our words are not just powerful, disproportionately powerful. Now, I love how James um, is about to approach this. I, I love the Bible, guys. I, I love God's word. I think it's 
interesting. I think it's life-changing. At times it's funny, and you're getting a little bit of all of those right here. So let's go to James chapter 3. Look at what he says. He says, we all stumble in many ways, indicating I'm about to talk to you about a really important one. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's like perfect. He is a perfect man, also able to bridle his entire body. He, he's saying, if you can ever figure out how to tame this little thing, your tongue, like there's nobody perfect, only Jesus was perfect. But if you can figure this out, that's about as perfect as anybody could ever possibly get. He says, if we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Think about that for just a second. He's, he's just given us another powerful example. Okay, so I brought my grandfather's uh, horse tack here. It's, it's the reins, it's the bridle. It's all kind of uh, <laughs> tangled right now, but, and it's the bit. Think about it. A 2,000 pound Clydesdale, you put this one pound piece of metal in their mouth, and now you can control them. Isn't that crazy? He's saying that's kind of what the tongue's like. It's disproportionately powerful in our lives. He says, look at the ships. You don't understand horses? Let's talk about boats. I think he's funny. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they're guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. Have you ever thought about that? Gigantic sailboat, you have to have this massive sail to catch a little bit of wind to get you to barely move, but to steer and completely turn around, what do you have to have? A teeny tiny little rudder to control the direction. He keeps on going. He says, so also the tongue is a small member. It's just like that. It's like the little bitty bit in the horse's mouth. It's like the little bitty rudder on the boat, yet it boasts of great things. He's saying, little bitty tongue, gigantic impact. Your tongue literally affects the destiny of your life. And he keeps going. He says, how great a forest is set ablaze by, by such a small fire. He's saying your words are like matches. Have you ever thought about that? Like a teeny tiny little wooden match can burn down billions of dollars of real estate, millions of acres of beautiful forest. It's happening in California right now. I read a story uh, this week where they traced one of these fires that's burned so many acres down back to a gender reveal party. They had a teeny tiny little pyrotechnic device that malfunctioned and set everything on fire. So glad you know if your baby's a boy or girl. Burned down half the state. Thank you. And it's not the first time that's happened, the article said. And that doesn't even seem possible, right? Like if you just have a book of matches and you're about to start the barbecue grill, you're not thinking, man... Like, if I strike this tiny little cardboard match and drop it over there instead of on the grill, it could burn the entire neighborhood down very quickly. We don't even think about how powerful a match is. He's saying, your tongue's like that. And we don't even think about it. It's disproportionately powerful. That's why we go, that's, that's why in your marriage you have a fight, and then you're like, I don't know why you're so upset. All I said was this, and then you, forest fire, right? He's saying your words are like that. You think they're like the teeny tiny little harmless thing, but, but they're not. They're disproportionately powerful. They can start a fire. You will never, ever be able to distinguish. I mean, think about what I could do with my words right now with this microphone in this church. I could say some stuff, and it'd be the most memorable sermon y'all have ever experienced in your life, right? Why? Because our words carry so much weight. The wars have been started by words. Divorces have happened because of words. Kingdoms have been divided because of words. Self-esteems have been destroyed because of words. Words carry so much power. They're disproportionately powerful. He gives us another idea. He says, and the tongue is a fire. Here's another idea, guys. The tongue is a fire. It's a world of unrighteousness. He's saying, it's like the day you're born you were born with a loaded weapon in your mouth and you didn't even have to go to a class to get the license to carry it around. Think about that. Parents, you never had to teach your kids to say bad stuff, did you? They just start saying it. The only thing you gotta teach them to say is good stuff, like please, thank you, you're welcome, I love you, good morning, instead of waking up and immediately griping at you, right? You don't have to teach your kids the bad stuff to say, only 
the good stuff. Why? Because the tongue's a fire. It's a world of unrighteousness. He says the tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body. It's, it's a teeny tiny little part of the body, but it'll get the whole entire thing. Setting on fire the entire course of life. He's saying with your mouth, you can burn it all down. Your marriage, your job, every relationship, and these fires, you won't be able to stop them. They'll go so fast, and there's no limit to what can happen when you choose to speak death because it is not a one-to-one -one correlation. It is disproportionately powerful. And then I love this last part, okay? He says, your tongue set among your members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life. I love it. And set on fire by hell. You start saying that to your kids, parents, when they say something bad. Says, Boy, your tongue is set on fire by hell. Say that to your boss, right? You'll probably get fired for that, but say it. You get the point. What's he telling us? He's saying it's not just, it's not just disproportionately powerful. It's also inherently evil. We're going to use these adverbs all day, all right? It's inherently evil. He's saying the default setting on the tongue is mean, rude, not, ha not healthy, not, not holy, not, not helpful. And, and why is that? Well, as Christians, we believe when sin corrupted the entire world, it got our tongues too. It corrupted every single thing about our world. This is the very reason you, you also never had to teach your teenage daughter to let her backbone slip and give you some attitude, right? She just started doing it one day because the tongue is inherently evil. Now, he, he's got more ideas. Check this out. James keeps going. He says, for every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, the, those things, they can all be tamed and have been tamed by mankind. You can go down to San Antonio Zoo. You're not scared of the bear. You're not scared of the jaguar they got, right? You're not scared of these things. Why? We're, we're humans. We rule and reign above the animals. Now, you've probably got a spider you're scared of or whatever. If you're, if you're me, it's frogs. I hate them. They're the devil, okay? Like, we've... <laughs> But we've tamed the animals, okay? And then check out what he says. This is so cool. He says, but no human being can tame the tongue. Nobody. So now he's all up in the faces of those of you who thought, I do pretty good with my words. I say nice stuff all the time. You're a liar, and you need this too. We all do, all right? He says, it is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. So he's telling us the tongue is humanly untamable disproportionately powerful, humanly untamable, inherently evil. He's saying you, you cannot fix your tongue on your own. You can't. Now, thank God he's given us the Holy Spirit. And with the power of the Holy Spirit, we can speak more life than death. But the propensity to speak death, it's always going to be there. And so it's something we've got to always be thinking about. Why? Because words carry so much power the power of life and death. And here's some proof of that. I mean, some of you, you can trace back a very difficult negative season of your life to just a few words a parent said. And maybe even to this day, decades later, you've never worked through that thing that they said, and it's hurt you for so long. The tongue is humanly untamable. James says, here's another thought for you about your tongue. With it, we bless our Lord and Father and also with it, we curse people. And then he reminds us, who, by the way, are made in the likeness of God. Isn't that true? We will come to church, hands in the air, using our tongue to sing praises to Jesus, right? Jesus, we love you. We run to the Father, all that. And then we get in the car, and we're cussing out our spouse. We get to the restaurant, and we're like, I ordered sweet tea, not regular tea. Risen, frozen, 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 right? Like, we can... We can curse people made in the image of God with the very same tongue that we worship God with. That, that's crazy. And then he says, from the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not be so. He's not saying uh, these things are bad. He's saying they're bad, but they shouldn't even be possible. But it totally is possible. And we totally do this all the time. And then he says, does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. And so here's kind of James' 
last idea. It's that the tongue is contrastingly productive. Remember, it's not just death. Okay, we kind of studied the death part if we're not careful. It's also life. It carries the power of life and death. And we need to know that both are always there. And clearly, I don't got to talk to you about which choice we need to make. What I'm trying to get you to understand is that just like we can burn everything down in our life if we speak death, we can really build everything up in our life and make it better if we'll speak life. If it can do so much bad, it can also do so much good, which is why it's so important that as we talk about healthy families and marriages and relationships, we, we talk about our words. Now, here's what I love most about the book of James right here. Chapter three, I wish I could keep clicking and show you a little more about our words, but it's funny. Dude just stops. He doesn't say anything else about it. He, he's basically like, our words are horrible. Here's some examples. I don't know why our mouths are so bad. I don't know what to do. Let's pray and go home. <laughs> That's basically James' message right there. But the crazy thing is he does talk about it in some other places in the book of James, and the entire Bible talks about our words all over the place. Remember, when we study Scripture, what's one of the very best tools we have? We study Scripture with Scripture. Okay, Google, that's great. You can use that. Okay, other people's blogs or thoughts or books, great. But ultimately, we study Scripture with other Scripture. So what do some of the other Scriptures say? Because, listen, I believe with all my heart, and our church has always been built upon the words of Jesus, that, that the stuff he said to us in his word, he actually wants us to live. They weren't just pretty words to encourage us. No, it's to encourage us to actually live differently. So that's why there's always an application, and I want to take you to the application, and, and the fact is we could zigzag all over God's word to look at our words, and I could give you so many different applications, but I just want to give you one. I'm hoping that if I just give you one, and it's the one I believe to be the most powerful one, that maybe it will help us with so many of the other applications about our words. Okay, so here it is. If you're ready, say, come on. All right, here's the application. We're going to wait. Before we talk, we're just going to wait. And what does wait stand for? It stands for, why am I talking? <laughs> Amen? Like, imagine, if the power of life and death are in our tongues, if our words carry that much weight, it can't hurt to slow down and wait a second before we speak. Sometimes that means 10 seconds. Sometimes it means 10 days. Sometimes it means God's going to tell you, keep your mouth shut. You don't need to say a dang thing ever. Right? Just imagine like how many issues in your own marriage would never have been issues if you waited before you spoke. Imagine how many relationships that have been destroyed in your life, friendships, right? Or even a relationship with a child could have been so much better if you or maybe them just waited for a second. Just wait. Don't you love how simple but also practical and powerful God's word is? Just wait. Well, pastor, does God's word say that? Yep, absolutely. I wish this was my idea. I'm just not that smart, y'all. It's my job to tell you what the Bible says. Here's what it says. Look at Proverbs 21. Those who wait. Those who guard their mouths and their tongues keep themselves from calamity. This is another one of those scriptures. It's like we've read it, but we just kind of go right past it, right? This is telling me it's my responsibility to guard my mouth. It is your responsibility to guard your mouth. It's not their responsibility to figure out how to take what you said in such a way that they'll be okay with it. Only if you want to burn your life down. No, the way we stay away from calamity is by guarding our tongues. Just wait. Now, practically, what does wait look like? What does it look like to just wait for a second? Okay, it's got a couple steps. Pause, ponder, pray. I like, they all start with a P, so it preaches better. All right, pause, ponder, pray. I'm going to stop. Instead of just, Bleh! I'm going to ponder. I'm going to think for a minute. All right, if I say this, is it even totally true? Or am I kind of inflating it? Like one of the ones we do in marriage is we say, all the time. And we totally know the truth is, no, every once in a while. You do this all the time. No, they did it like twice in 10 years. <laughs> right? Pause, ponder, pray. Talk to God about it. Can it hurt to talk to God about anything in your life? 
before you do that thing? No, this is great wisdom from God's word. We're just going to wait. Why am I talking? We're going to pause. We're going to ponder. We're going to pray. Because how many times have you said something you wished you had not said? You wished you'd prayed before you said it. You wished you'd thought a second before you said it so you could say it right. And I told you that James talks about this. Go to James chapter one. He says, understand this, my dear brothers and sisters. You must all be, I love it, quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to get angry. Quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to get angry. He's like, I want you to go quick, slow, slow. Problem is we like to go slow, quick, quick. We just wanna talk so often, we don't wanna listen at all. And, and even when we're listening, come on, how many of us are guilty of this? Even when we're listening, we're only listening to see their mouth stop moving so we can talk. So the whole time they're talking, we don't hear a word they're saying. We're just like, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and then it's my turn, <laughs> right? Man, maybe, maybe we need to be quick to listen. Okay, you talk. And then we're gonna go have a good dinner as a family. And then we're going to pray together and we're going to go to bed. And maybe, if God says it's okay, I'll respond tomorrow. That would be quick to listen, slow to speak. And the result of that is slow to get angry. What if we just waited for a second, paused for a second, thought for a second, prayed for a second? And by the way, you need to know, you can think in two different places. Did you know that? You can think with the mind God gave you, but also with the heart God gave you. Now, I'm not talking about your, not, not that heart, okay? We're talking about the soulish part of who you are. Y'all know what I mean? This is why the scripture says in Luke 2 that Mary treasured all these things and pondered them in her heart. This is why it says in, in Hebrews 4 that the word of God is alive and active. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. This is why it says in Matthew 9, Jesus knew their thoughts. He knew what was in their heart. You can think with your mind, but also your heart. And sometimes the mind can be a foolish part of us. You know what's so cool? Medical science is even now starting to understand this. I found this um, article in a medical journal, and it's about 10 years old, and I just wanna read a small little part of it to you. I'm just gonna read it word for word. It says, when some transplant patients received their brand new heart, they discovered that the previous owners had also donated a few eerie thoughts. After recovering from their operation, several recipients started recounting incidents that had recurred in their donor's life. A 52-year-old man loved classical music, but after being given the heart of a teenage boy, he discovered he liked rock music. What a good transplant. A man who had received a heart from a woman who was hit by a train had recurring dreams about train accidents. After an eight-year-old girl received the heart of a murdered child, she started having recurring nightmares. She even described the circumstances of her donor's death with such detail that the police were able to capture the murderer who was later convicted. And this, they had like a hundred stories where they had studied these heart transplants and that's just the ones that kind of stuck out to me. And the reason I'm telling you this is if we would just wait and pause and ponder and, and pray about our words, you know what we could do? We could engage, yes, our minds, but even more importantly, our heart. Our heart, because our heart is the part that Jesus says, you're born again. And he puts a brand new one inside of you. Now your mind is being transformed daily. Scripture says, Romans chapter 12, be transformed daily by the renewing of your mind. He doesn't change your mind immediately, changes your heart immediately and everything else gotta catch up. And so yeah, stop and think, but even think about how you think. Think about some of the most common phrases we use today. If you're just kind of lobbing a thought out there, what do you say? You say, hey, this is just off the top of my head. Meaning, I'm not sure I even believe this or mean this. But if you absolutely believe it, you absolutely mean it, what do you say? This is from the bottom of my heart. We need to let our brand new, renewed, transformed hearts tell our renewing minds what to think so that our renewing mind can tell us what to say. That's how we give God our words. So Heavenly Father, we just cry out to you that we need your help. We know our words carry the power of life and death, and we know that we tend to just kind of overlook this. 
Father, we know our, our words can, can bring health and vitality and change and powerful and healthy and godly relationships, but we know that it can also destroy all of that. And we know that the power is disproportionate. It, not only can it destroy it, it can do it so fast. Father, help us to learn how to tap into the renewed heart that you have given us. Help us to wait before we speak. If that sounds like something you want to pray today, just lift your hand real quick and I'm going to pray for you. If you just say, yes, God, I need help in my words sometimes. I admit it before you. Father, I need to lean into you. Help me to pause. Help me to just think a little. Help me to pray. Help me to say, why am I talking? So many hands. You can put them down. God, for everyone who lifted their hand, what we're really lifting is the heart we've talked about. And so, Father, we cry out to you, help us. We need you to teach us, Jesus. We need you to lead us. We need to learn how to lean heavier into you and your Holy Spirit than ever before. Help our words to be powerful words that bring life. And as you continue to talk to God about that, some of you even need to um, commit to God that when you get home today, you're going to ask for forgiveness for some very death-filled words that, that you said at some point. Could have even been this week. You can't ever take those words back, but God can redeem them because of the cross. He can bring healing and forgiveness. So as you just talked to God about that for a second, listen, if you're hearing, you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, just like our words connect us with each other, our words also connect us with God. And the Bible says that if we will believe in our heart and confess with our mouth, with our words, that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he's the only way that we will be saved, that our spot in eternity in heaven, it'll be secured forever, that our heart will be renewed, that we get to be a part of God's family, God's kingdom. If that sounds like you, if you're ready to take that step, you're ready to give Jesus Christ your life. We wanna help you say some words, a prayer. It doesn't do anything magical. It, it's whether or not this is from your heart. It's whether or not you're giving your heart to Jesus and he sees your heart, he knows your heart. He knows what no man can know and sees what no man can see about you. So if you would make this your faith confession, to believe on him as the savior, the leader, the Lord of your life, I want you to pray like this. And church family, let's all pray it out loud together so nobody has to do this alone. Can you repeat after me? Heavenly Father, I give you my life. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Savior. I surrender to him. I repent from my sin, God, and I turn to you. Please make me a brand new person. In Jesus' name, amen.